The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 16134 in the name of Colin Beatty on International Museum Day. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I, ask, I call on Colin Beatty to open the debate. Mr Beatty, please. Presenting officer. International Museums Day has been an important date on our calendar since its inception in 1977. It presents us with an opportunity to consider the extraordinary privilege that we have in Scotland to be able to enjoy such a vast wealth of museums, a vast breadth of galleries, and a plethora of museums of all kind across our mainland and its islands. Now, I know the presiding officer herself would have wished to take part in this debate, particularly, I, know, I have no doubt, mentioning the National Mining Museum of Scotland in Newton Grange within her constituency. However, she's otherwise employed. <laughs> I've always been passionate about museums and galleries, but not just in Scotland. Like too many people of my generation, the opportunities for a career were very limited without leaving my home country. So I began what became a global journey, living in many countries with vastly different cultures for very many years. And during that time, I quickly learned that one of the best ways to rapidly get to know a country was to visit the museums and galleries, which laid out the ideas of the people of my new host nation and its history and amazing arts and crafts. And each time I returned to Scotland on home leave, I would spend much of my time in museums and galleries in Edinburgh and Dundee. I didn't pause then to consider how much education and understanding was being offered to me in these visits. They were just enormously enjoyable sources of knowledge of heritage and past relationships with other nations. But it was impossible to ignore the splendor of our co collections here in Scotland, compared with so many other countries who had suffered losses from war and extreme weather, not to mention poverty. And since those days, I, I still seek out opportunities to visit our museums and galleries, like so many of those of us fortunate enough to live in Scotland, as well as the ever-increasing number of tourists from elsewhere. And I was struck recently with the realization that though our museums tell us about our past, the buildings that house them are sometimes very much of our present and our future. In June 2011, the truly extraordinary Riverside Museum of Glasgow was completed. It currently houses Glasgow Museum of Transport, and the building was designed by Zaha Hadid. The museum, this museum has all kinds of transport designed by the world acclaimed architect, and this is what she had to say about this remarkable contribution to our heritage and to our city of Glasgow. Through architecture, we can investigate future possibilities, yet also explore the cultural foundations that have defined the city. The Riverside Museum is a fantastic and truly unique project where the exhibits and building come together at this prominent and historic location on the Clyde to infuse and inspire all visitors. The design, combining geometric complexity with structural ingenuity and material authenticity, continues and, and Glasgow, continues Glasgow's rich engineering traditions and will be a part of the city's future as a centre of innovation. It's home to 3,000 objects and has attracted 1.5 million visitors, which is hardly surprising. However, it's not just in our growing cities that we find some of our most splendid and fascinating museums. Highland Council now hosts the Highland Folk Museum in Newton Moor, but that's developed a long way from the early years when it was recognised as Britain's first mainland open-air museum when it opened in Kingussie in 1944. It's a living history museum where Scotland, Scottish Highland ancestors' way of life can be experienced. We can see how they lived, how they built their homes, how they dressed, and even how they grew their food. It's now set in an 80-acre site with restored buildings and actors who help visitors to travel in time. It is to Dr. Isabel Francis Grant that we owe a debt of gratitude for the early beginnings of this exciting museum. It was in 1930 that she organized and curated the Highland Exhibition with 2,100 artifacts in Inverness. And by 1935, she had founded the Highland Folk Museum on the island of Iona, and 800 visitors were recorded in the first year of opening and more the following year. There's much to say about this remarkable museum, but there are others I'd like to comment on, and as you know, time's limited. But it would be remiss of me not to make reference to the thoughtful outreach work at the Highland Museum. Through the use of Shinty, the Shinty collection and many photographs, stories, and the songs the enthusiastic team at this museum used to meet sufferers of dementia, shedding light on the dimming memories when Shinty was a regular part of life in the Highlands. Through the storytelling and informal gathering, this social outreach program has made a substantial contribution to the well-being of many local residents affected by this debilitating condition. There are other museums with similar programs at the National Library of Scotland, National Galleries of Scotland, the National Museum of Scotland, and other organizations which have sessions offered for those suffering dementia. 
tea and cake with a range of activities inspired by the collections help these visitors to have some fun and social activity whilst being stimulated by the experience. Social programs are only one of the additional benefits that our nation's museums and galleries contribute. I previously alluded to the inspiring architectural contribution of the design by Zaha Hadid in Glasgow. However, I'm sure you're all well aware of our recent splendid edition in Dundee. The v and has received well-deserved international acclaim, having attracted architects from around the world to compete for the opportunity to design it. And it's just been shortlisted as one of the five finalists for Art Fund Museum of the Year 2019. In my own constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh, we're proud to have two museums serving our communities. One is in the historic county town of Dalkeith and the other in the honest town of Musselburgh. Each of these is staffed exclusively by volunteers who are passionate about their communities and the extraordinary part they've played in history. If you've not yet had the pleasure of visiting Musselburgh, I won't spoil your fun by telling you too much, but these dedicated museum volunteers have presented their local residents with themed exhibitions in the historic town hall, in addition to hosting permanent exhibits for younger and older visitors alike, which illustrate the colorful history and culture of this fishing community. <clears throat> the role of the women as the fishwives of Musselburgh is well recorded, and photographs of a lifestyle now long gone is vividly presented to generations of young people who are now the community members of Musselburgh, as well as visitors who come from Australia, Canada, and USA to discover their heritage. Hosted by a local housing association, Dalkeith Museum is located in the magnificently restored Corn Exchange. Dalkeith Railway Station, like so many in Scotland, closed long ago, but thanks to a remarkable piece of good luck, the 19th century bronze station bell that would have once sounded the departure of trains has now been restored and is currently on display at the Dalkeith Museum after being lost from Midlothian for more than 50 years. It sits amongst many artifacts which reflect and inform the local community. Visits from school group, group, groups and local residents as well as tourists are recorded. All this is a testament to the dedicated commitment of the many curators and conservation professionals who care for this heritage, who ensure that the buildings which are home to these collections are bright, comfortable, and well-maintained spaces. The thoughtful and creative display of these images and artifacts change our perception of ourselves. It expands our knowledge and our understanding of our nation's heritage, its historical importance, our relationship with the rest of the world. It means more than looking at museums and galleries. It informs our future, and we thank you who make this possible for your remarkable enterprise and diligence. I know that International Museums Day will be celebrated for many years to come, and I hope that my motion in this members' debate will be the beginning of a tradition of the Parliament recognising this special day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beesey. And I call Kenneth Gibson, who will be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to congratulate my colleague Colin Beattie for securing uh, today's debate and giving us the opportunity to mark International Museum Day, which took place on Saturday, the 18th of May. Before museums, Renaissance Europe had their ancestors, cabinets of curiosity. These cabinets filled with a rare, eclectic and esoteric were the preserve of wealthy European aristocrats and usually housed in private palace rooms. As early as 1587, an advisor to Christian I of Saxony set out a wish list of sculptures, paintings, curious items from home or abroad and antlers, horns, claws, feathers and other things belonging to strange or curious animals. These cabinets not only served as a collection to reflect the interests and explorations of their curators, but also largely social devices to establish a person's rank in society. Most people would have little opportunity to view these wonders or indeed participate in their curation. Now museums have become spaces that invite everyone to engage with the past and the objects or ideas that diverse communities throughout the history of humanity have held dear. As Colin Beatty's motion reminds us, museums have developed into vital cultural hubs which can foster peace and understanding. Scotland's museum collections are immensely diverse and the full extent of museum activities across the country is not yet known, making it difficult to put a financial value on the impact of Scotland's museums on tourists, tourism and the cultural economy. Yet a report by the Moffat Centre for Travel and Tourism and Business Development at Glasgow Caledonian University did find that 52% of museum visitors are local, making museums a vital local cultural facility that draws in tourists and enriches local life. One such museum in my constituency is West Kilbride, which invites residents and, and visitors alike to explore life in the parish over the past 400 years. 
Since its inception in 1988, a dedicated team of local volunteers have sustained an enviable collection of relics from all sections of the town and its surrounding areas, and their hard work does not end there. As Scotland's craft town, West Kilbride is home to a wonderful array of local artists working across varied mediums, and their works are frequently on display in West, uh, West Kilbride Museum, tying in four centuries of history with the modern world. Its exhibits embody the town's colourful story and map local events, such as the centenary year of West Kilbride Boys Club, uh, currently being celebrated with an exhibition of memorabilia. Inviting people to discover the history, traditions and development of West Kilbride surely increases people's pride in their community and inspires them to help shape its story going forward. Today in North Ayrshire, we are lucky enough to enjoy a variety of museums, from the traditional exhibition to the immersive experience. At Skelmily Secret Bunker, visitors get a chilling insight into the reality of the Cold War. This monitoring post, 15 feet underground, was designed to detect a nuclear attack. Uh, my constituent, Frank Alexander, took over the lease of the building in 2004 when it was just a shell and with dedication and determination has kitted it out with authentic equipment to recreate the mood uh, of an era when the nuclear threat was at its greatest. Climbing deep into the earth, you're overwhelmed with a real sense of taking a step both into the past and a future uh, that never transpired and a threat that thankfully was never realised. That is what the best museums do, make us feel something. Where they help us feel proud of where we have come from, inspire us, challenge us or stimulate us, museums of all sizes can have an enormous impact on our well-being. And this is especially true, true, true today when more and more museums are developing their role as socially purposeful organisations to deliver positive social impact. Gone are the days when museums were quiet, cold and foreboding places. They're now more welcoming, more accessible and serve as a host for an incredible variety of cultural and social events. There is an increased sense today that museums belong to the people who visit them. Scottish writer Andrew O'Hagan helped put this feeling into words when he spoke of his connection with the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery Museum in Glasgow, something which as a child I was very familiar with. On his first step through the museum's doors, he was struck by a thought. This was ours, all ours, the paintings, the light, the stonework. It belonged to the people of Glasgow and to me. Presiding officer, uh, everyone in Scotland is able to feel that level of connection to a museum or gallery, I believe, whether it is indeed somewhere local or somewhere that simply captures their imagination. And I thank Colin Beattie for once again facilitating this, facilitating this opportunity to reflect upon International Museum Day 2019 and upon the unique value of each and every one of Scotland's museums. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call Rachel Hamilton, followed by Jenny Mara. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Shadow Culture and Tourism Spokesperson for the Scottish Conservatives, I'm delighted to speak in Colin Beattie's debate on International Museum Day. Museums are an integral part of showing off the very best of Scotland, whether it's our rich history, varied geography or diverse culture. We have a plethora of fantastic museums right on our doorsteps, which offer a wonderful window of our colourful past. I was honoured recently to visit the new Moat Bray in Dumfries, and it was a sneak peek uh, because I was actually at a function there. It's not yet open. It opens in June. It's the childhood home of J.M. Barry and most people in this chamber would have read the book Peter Pan. I would thoroughly recommend a visit if you're ever down in uh, Joe McCall Pine and Oliver Mundell's uh, way. Oh, and Finlay Carson. And in my own constituency of Ettrick, Rocks and Berkshire, we have the wonderful Jim Clark Museum in Duns, and that's near completion. As you uh, may be aware, Jim Clark was an exceptional Formula One driver, becoming the Formula one world champion in 1963 and 1965, achieving 72 Grand Prix starts, 25 wins and 33 pole positions across his career. He was a true inspiration to a generation of sports fans and he's remembered very fondly in the Scottish borders. And it's really fitting that we'll see this year the opening of that new Jim Clark Museum and the famous rally, of course, returned to the country roads of Berwickshire. Building work got underway last year and the opening of the new museum will coincide with the 50th anniversary of the original memorial room being opened by Jim Clark's parents. And the aim of the new museum is to inspire the next generation and generations to come with a modern and vibrant celebration of Jim Clark's incredible career and the impact that he had on motorsport around the world with his trophies that have been collected and pictures and film footage and some of the cars which he raced Exhibiting the cars in which Jim Clark raced 
will be the highlight of the new museum with the ex existing trophy collection at its heart. And I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank the hard work of the many volunteers and Scottish Borders Council Heritage Lottery Fund and those who've given up uh, their time and so generously have been instrumental in bringing this project to fruition. I, I really can't wait um, for this museum to open. And uh, again, as well as the uh, new Moat Bray, I would encourage everyone to take a trip down to the borders to enjoy this excellent museum when it opens. Um, presiding officer, museums have amazing power, not only to display, display great historical artifacts, um, paintings and objects, but also to be inspirational, informative and, and enlightening and educational. And they draw in tourists from everywhere and Scotland has its fair share of fascinating museums. And last year, uh, of course, Scotland was pleased to see that the National Museum of uh, Scotland drew in more than two million visits, a first for any Scottish attraction. And they do a wonderful job, of course, in accommodating our tourists from across the world with multilingual audio headsets and tours. And I would ask the Scottish Government to think too of the importance of the smaller museums in exhibiting local cu culture and history. And the Jim Clark Museum is just a small example of that. It's taken an awful lot of work to get to this point, but it is important that we don't forget about um, those smaller museums that do need necessarily su support to invest in this provision. I would also, in the small time that I've got, um, ask that the um, Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government consider supporting more public museums and galleries to establish themselves as dementia friendly. And I know uh, Colin Beatty has, has just mentioned that. There is no definition of dementia friendly. And it's not just about putting a sticker to say this. This is about, um, uh, this is about all sorts of, of changes easy changes, that p simple things that people um, can make uh, to make a carer's experience um, uh, much easier and also someone um, experiencing uh, the, the dementia condition. Just to conclu uh, conclude, presiding officer, I want to encourage everyone of all ages to visit a museum on or around International Mu Museum Day. Every day is a school day and you'll never know what you might learn next. Thank you very much. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Ms. Mara, please. Presiding officer, I'm uh, delighted and proud to uh, speak in this debate this evening, and I thank Colin Beatty very much for bringing the debate to the chamber. Proud because it was in 2001 that um, a Labour government, uh, four years into office, uh, made all museums across the UK free entry. Now, some were before and some were still charging, but with uh, Gordon Brown's uh, VAT arrangements, we managed to make uh, entry and accessibility to every museum across the country completely free. And that underpinned our commitment to public accessibility, to artwork and to our history. And I think it's an achievement we can all agree um, was uh, very worthwhile and we can all be very proud of. Presiding officer, for me, museums are a celebration of life and are also commemorations and historical lessons of humanity's catastrophes and serve so, such important purposes for both. <clears throat> and I was just reflecting um, as I prepared for the debate today of the impact of museums on my life. One of the earliest um, recollections I have of being in a museum is in the, the Barrack Street Museum in Dundee, which is now used as a storage facility for our other museums in the city, where the great skeletal car carcass of the Tay Whale that was removed um, from uh, the longest river in Scotland used to hang above my head, and I used to be in permanent fear that it would fall onto my head. But I remember visiting that very regularly as a child and it now hangs in the refurbished uh, McManus galleries in Dundee which Dundee City Council uh, very beautifully restored just a few years ago and it's become a real hub in the city. Another early memory was queuing in Market Street just down the road from here to see Tutankhamun's mask in the 1980s. I can't put an exact year on it. I think it was roughly 1985, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will remember. And I remember there being a huge buzz uh, in my primary school and uh, in the community about this um, 
a worldwide historical artefact coming to Scotland and Scottish school children being able to see it. From huge events like that, that had a real national significance, to the smaller, more intimate museums that colleagues have talked about, such as the Lewis Grass at Gibbon exhibition up in the Mairns, which is beautifully accessible to everyone who has read that book and is visiting the stunning landscape of that part of the northeast. Museums are such an integral, um, an important cultural and emotional part of our lives. I remember as a student then, the whole world of the London uh, museums and exhibitions opening up, the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I took great delight in visiting, most summers we went to London, the British Museum and the stunningly beautiful reading room and taking great uh, delight in sitting in Karl Marx's regular seat in the reading room in the British Museum. I was lucky enough also on a scholarship to the US to then visit museums like the Metropolitan in New York. And the learning experience you can have in these places goes on for days, if not months and years. Presiding officer, I was struck just a few weeks ago by the video that was released on social media of all living UK prime ministers announcing the new Holocaust memorial and museum that is to be in London. I think it's very fitting and perhaps long overdue uh, development. Um, and I thought it was a, a very good initiative that all living UK prime ministers had taken the time to lend their support to, uh, to this very important initiative. Because we all, all know any visitors to Berlin have seen the power uh, that the, uh, the German nation has managed to create from their national memorials, exhibitions and museums to the horrific events that happened in the 30s and 40s in Germany with the lesson that humanity must never repeat these tragedies. And on a visit recently to Srebrenica um, and uh, to Sarajevo as part of the uh, Remembering Srebrenica Trust here in Scotland. And I know there's another visit um, going at the moment. The museums at Potokari of this terrible genocide were clean to see. Presiding officer, I, I, I realise I've gone slightly over my time, but I hope you will allow me to talk a little bit about the V&A in Dundee, because obviously for our community, the addition of the V&A has been such a significant um, addition to our city, to the cultural life of our city, and I pay tribute to the Scottish Government and to Fiona Hislop and her role on that. It's exceeded expectations in terms of visitors numbers, the impact on tourism in Dundee, there were some new figures released uh, yesterday, and the confidence of our city. And I hope that our new museum will have some of the impact in years to come that I've described in some of our other museums in Scotland and across the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Stewart will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. No, can I start by echoing um, Jenny Mara's comments in relation to the V&A, which I have uh, still to visit, but it is very much at top of the list. Can I also uh, thank uh, Colin Beatty for uh, allowing this debate on an issue that is clearly a real passion uh, of uh, his. Can I also thank him uh, for the highly successful reception uh, last uh, week in, in Parliament. I was delighted that Stromness uh, Museum were able to be uh, in attendance there. And their stand, like I think all the other stands that evening, uh, were extremely busy through the, the course uh, of the evening. Um, Stromness Museum were showcasing the innovative work that they've been doing alongside um, the uh, Dundee University in 3D modelling um, the wrecks of, of Scapa Flow, bringing that uh, home to a, a wider audience than was perhaps possible uh, before. And I think museums and, and galleries uh, help make Orkney the community that it is. It's, in a sense, a kind of microcosm of what Colin Beattie was describing in relation to Scotland as a whole. We are blessed with a vibrant cultural scene. I think that stems from the value that we attach to heritage. Um, not only have we the Stromness Museum, the Orkney Museum, we've got Linus, Corrigal Farm, Fossil Centre, the Wireless Museum, the Long Hope Lifeboat Museum, and a community of 21,000, those and other museums and galleries, I think, uh, demonstrate the extent to which uh, Orkney really is punching above its weight uh, and attaching a value uh, to uh, that uh, heritage. And I pay uh, tribute to the staff and volunteers, um, as well as those that uh, support it uh, within the council and elsewhere for the work that they do. 
I was intrigued by a recent survey, I think, undertaken by the International Council of Museums about what museums are, and I think that in itself is a subject of, of lively debate. The respondents to this um, uh, came up with um, many weird, wonderful, uh, and, and in cases uh, quite imaginative responses. There was one from Greece suggesting museums are the factory of our dreams. Uh, from Germany came um, the suggestion that the museum is a walk-in library of our collective memory. Uh, for another, a museum is a place that attempts to elaborate human dignity and life quality through appreciation of love, peace, equality and nature. That coming perhaps surprisingly uh, from a respondent in Iran. Rather more prosaically, uh, somebody from uh, Slovakia suggested a museum is no longer just a place of collecting old stuff. Um, so I, I think a wide uh, variety of views there, I think encapsulating that museums and galleries probably mean very different things to different uh, people. The, perhaps a more interesting question might have been about what um, museums and galleries can be. Um, I think the digital engagement is something we're seeing across the board, uh, reflected in Stromness Museum's um, innovation around the wrecks of Scapa Flow, but co-curation that we're seeing, the decolonisation, uh, again, uh, that, we're, uh, that we're seeing happening as well. But in order to remain relevant, it, relevant they need to continue to focus on uh, the issues that affect people's lives. And so I think we're seeing more museums um, venturing into uh, describing um, uh, issues around poverty, around racism, around climate change, and a multitude of other issues. And I think that's absolutely right and proper. Uh, again, from the same uh, report in the museum's journal, um, there was a suggestion that a respondent to ICOM's uh, survey from Spain um, made the point that a museum is re uh, reborn as many times as it takes. And I think that is something that um, all good museums do strive uh, to do. But in order to be able to do that, funding is absolutely key, not just for the exhibitions or indeed the outreach, but as one uh, constituent made the point to me, for the under the bonnet stuff as well, the, the, the cataloguing that is absolutely uh, critical to the work that they do. And while we would push, um, I, I think, our museums to look at new models of funding, whether that's through, through donors, through sponsorship, through the, the merchandising that uh, many engage in, uh, I think it was uh, said uh, rather uh, powerfully that these models can only be sustainable with strong government backing in the form of uh, public policies and a clear commitment to fund museums' uh, daily operations. So hopefully uh, this uh, debate will help reinforce that point, that the value we attach has to be underscored by the, the funding that allow museums and galleries to do the work that they uh, do. I, I know the Cabinet Secretary is a strong supporter of that sector and I very much hope the Scottish Government would continue in that vein. But again, can I thank Colin Beattie for bringing this debate uh, and look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to take part in this evening's debate and I would commend Colin Beattie for bringing uh, and securing this debate this evening. As we've already heard, International Museum Day is a global celebration. It takes place around the 18th of May and is coordinated by international museums. And every year it highlights a different theme. Uh, international Museum Day also gives the chance for museum professionals themselves to meet people and inform them about the many varied challenges that modern museums face in today's society. The definition of a museum is a permanent installation that is there to ensure that society is informed and has got some individual development. And the participation of museums uh, has shown that they're there to uh, communicate, research, conserve, acquire, and also they have the ability uh, to have exhibitions of, of human tangible and untangible heritage, as well as the environment to enjoy, to study and to process and to educate. All of these services are, are the platform for public awareness and it's very important that museums have that ability to organise and be part of our society and that becomes uh, the whole level of internationalism. And this year's theme is all about museums of a cultural hub and the future of tradition and that highlights the roles uh, that museums in society and the changing roles that they have seen over the years. 
As we've already heard, museums are there to be relevant within their area, to, uh, to show advice uh, and audience focus, the flexibility and the, and the adaptability uh, of ensuring that they can be relevant in today's society. With an increasing uh, popularity in computer-generated uh, virtual worlds and virtual uh, uh, places taking place across, I believe it's even more important than ever that museums can become cultural hubs and function and focus as a platform to contribute to create the knowledge within our society. We need to places where visitors can also create, they can share, they can interact, uh, and they get a real flavour of what's happening within that sector. Uh, and they view uh, the, the history and the historic achievements that are taking place. And in turn, they help to increase their knowledge, uh, their awareness, their tolerance of others around the world. Whilst that primary mission is to ensure that there is that communication, that collecting, that collaboration, that research or the exhibition, museums have transformed uh, their places and remain very much uh, held within communities today. They have a, an involvement, they have a capacity uh, to ensure that they, that they are. And we've heard today about different types of museums, whether it's a tartan museum or a toy museum or a transport museum, uh, and hundreds of them across Scotland uh, are viewed and visited on a daily basis. And and I'd like to pay tribute to one or two around the country. Can I first of all say about the uh, Scottish Submarine Centre at Helensburgh, which recently uh, was awarded a, a runner-up award in a national uh, campaign. I'd also like to talk about my own hometown of Perth, which has tra many traditional museums and art galleries which are world-renowned. And our own old city hall is about to become a new virtual uh, and vibrant new museum uh, which is going to create uh, 20 million pounds worth of money which has come from the, the Taste Cities deal and we look forward to seeing that uh, develop and move forward. In my own region of Mid-Scotland in Fife uh, there are many, you know, Stirling's Castle and its living museums, the fantastic Carnegie Library and Galleries in Dunfermline which once again has just recently won awards and we've already heard today from a number of speakers about the impressive V&A based in Dundee which has revolutionised the sector and continues to uh, shine a beacon and shine a light on uh, where we are. But by acting locally, museums can also individually advocate uh, the global problems that are taking place uh, and challenge the societies that we have. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, as institutions at the heart of society, museums have a real power to establish dialogue between cultures and build bridges and break down bridges uh, as they define the suitability for going forward. I commend and congratulate all involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Fiona Hislop to close the debate for Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, President Officer, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's motion on International Museums Day. Uh, first of all, thank you to Colin Beatty for bringing this motion forward and for his excellent speech and indeed commitment to the museum sector. Um, and also to all the very interesting contributions from the colleagues uh, who have spoken and those that have supported the debate as well. And it's quite clear from uh, the signatories to the motion and the contribution, there is cross-party support for the sector. Uh, last week's International Museums Day event in the Scottish Parliament uh, was hosted uh, by Museum Gallery Scotland and kindly sponsored again by Colin Beattie and it saw representatives from over 50 museums come together to celebrate the museum sector's hard work in keeping our heritage alive. Um, and I was very pleased uh, to see at that exhibition uh, further examples of the innovation taking place within Scotland's museum sector. Uh, Liam MacArthur referred to Stromness's museum's Living Wrecks, the Marine Life of Scapa Flow exhibition. It was a, a highlight of the exhibition uh, and it was an interactive exhibition utilising 3D imagery, dive video footage of virtual reality to help visitors explore the maritime heritage of Scapa Flow with added sea turtles, great white sharks and blue whales. Uh, the museum's uh, partners have created those 3D scans of the museum artefacts, uh, vastly increasing the accessibility of Scapa Flow's heritage. Uh, and they're also securely recorded, meaning that future generations will be able to see exactly what we do now. So I noted in my speech last week um, at the Museum Galleries event that museums allow us to communicate, uh, communicate across time and culture. Um, to further ensure sustainability, museums have by necessity bec uh, become local cultural hubs, an opportunity that has inspired new ways for museums to present their collections and engage with their communities and visitors. And museums have always held a, a place in our hearts, uh, presenting us with seemingly endless objects and stories to light up our imagination. 
And I can only imagine the excitement of the children seeing the towering form of Dippy the Diplodocus uh, during his recent visit to the Kelvin Grove Museum, his first trip outside London since 1905. And as much as um, Dippy's visit was to inspire learning, uh, numerous events were organized, expanding Dippy's role beyond a larger than life copy of Dinosaur Bones. So draw Dippy like Leonardo, uh, like Dippy's stay to the temporary Leonardo da Vinci exhibition being held at the Kelvin Grove at the same time, an exploration of natural history through art. And it's an example of how museums are changing the way they engage with their visitors and how they present the stories of the, his the history in their care. Museums are also on the lookout for ways to tackle contemporary issues as well as will be seen in the National Museum of Scotland's Body Beautiful Diversity on the Catwalk exhibition. And Body Beautiful will explain how the fashion industry is challenging modern perceptions of beauty and encouraging diversity, including examples from designers such as Vivian Westwood and Jean-Paul Gaultier. Scotland's National Museums obviously play a, a vital role in setting the larger picture of Scotland's historical scientific and cultural histories uh, and they do a fantastic job uh, and they also host international exhibitions and I was smiling at Jenny Myra's um, reference to seeing the Tutankhamun mask. Uh, I think I saw it in around about 1970 at the British Museum when I was a tiny child and I had to spend five hours queuing to see the mask but I remember it's lasted an impression on me and uh, Jenny Myra also referred to in her speech about her personal reflections also, um, she referred to the McManus Museum and Galleries, which I think really is, is quite an outstanding uh, refurbishment and, and uh, exhibition space. Uh, in my own constituency, I've got museums that are changing too. Uh, the new Linlithgow Museum, with its three new galleries and a bespoke community space, aims to bring the history of Linlithgow to the fore in a fresh interpretation of the Royal Borough's history. And it's the result of the Linlithgow Heritage Trust, a new museum for Royal Linlithgow project. It successfully applied to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for a grant of £240,000 to enable community involvement in the development, delivery and interpretation of the borough's heritage. And of the various exhibition highlights, uh, I'd draw your attention to the Adopt an Object scheme, which invites uh, patrons of the museum to sponsor an object for a year and this creates a steady stream of income that can be used for improvements to the building conservation of exhibition items and publicity in addition I understand that there are plans to host art workshops and a community archaeology dig uh, increasing that con connectivity with the local community and um, so I'm excited about what's happening in my own area but of course other members have spoken about uh, museums in their area and galleries in the area Kenny Gibson uh, talked about West Cobride's contribution um, and his constituency I visited uh, the gallery uh, earlier this year and indeed purchased one of the artworks uh, from a fantastic exhibition that I saw there. Rachel Hamilton referred to Jim Clark's museum, a new museum. And I think that's a reflection that uh, there are actually new things happening in the museum area. It's not just about existing museums. And we've heard about obviously the V&A as well. So in terms of uh, the vibrancy of the ambition for local places to have uh, museums and also to take on the national role like the V&A has, there really is something uh, I think to be said about that dynamism in the museum sector. But it's also impossible to understand the role of museums without taking into account the connections they make. They are an inherent part of our local communities. They act as a platform for placing local history in a global context. Museums Gallery Scotland administers the museum's recognition scheme. It celebrates, promotes and invests in nationally significant collections beyond our national museums and galleries. Scotland currently has 49 such collections, uh, many actually in often small rural um, museums uh, that are immensely varied, but equally as important in the array of objects that they contain reflecting centuries of effort. Um, these collections, as with the accredited museums, allow Scotland to be part of that global exchange of history, ideas and learning. Alexander Stewart talked about the role of museums in society and one of the groups most possibly affected by the growth of museums is the older generation. There are many older citizens who suffer from dementia, referred to by Rachel Hamilton, who are living in poverty or are socially isolated, who benefit from the idea of museums as cultural hubs. I was fortunate last week to hear about some of the great work uh, being carried out in Glasgow and Edinburgh uh, with older people. Diana Morton, outreach manager at Edinburgh and Glasgow Councils, noted some of the fantastic work being done by council uh, museums. This includes the Contact the Elderly scheme, uh, where socially isolated older people are picked up by drivers and brought to a museum once a month on a Sunday for activity and a cup of tea. 
I'd also like to offer a special mention to Stob Hill Hospital in Springburn, within the secure units of the Isla and Dura Adult Mental Health and Dementia Wards, objects from Glasgow museums have been placed into display areas and cases in the walls to encourage conversation between the staff, the residents and visitors. And the objects in question range from model ships to sewing machines and were all selected by hospital staff. And the walls themselves stimulate memory, make the environment a much nicer place to be and have been well received by those that aim to help. Uh, and that's an example of the well-being that museums can provide for all of us, whatever our age. So to conclude, presiding officer, um, we heard from uh, Liam MacArthur about uh, definitions of, of uh, museums and uh, as factory of dreams, or as I took it, walk in a library, a walk in library of, a collect of our collective memory. But I always remember the wee boy that said to me when I asked him, what, why he thought museums were important, and he answered that they keep the memories of our people. And yes, they are places, museums are places, uh, but they're imbued with the spirit and the stories of people and that sense of where we've been and where we're going in the future. And I'm happy to take part in this debate and commend Colin Beattie for bringing it to Parliament. Thank you. That concludes this debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>